welcome to our continuing story of Los Alamitos and its community. I'm your host, Mert Parashow. And we're going to do a second part of our show tonight on Rossmore. It's tri the attempted incorporation, the school board, and all the things that have happened in Rossmore. And we have two excellent experts with us. We have Henry Zack and Paul Erskine. Welcome, fellas. You. Glad you're here. Glad to be here. Let's start with you, Henry. Um, you were on the school board when? Yes, uh, from about 1961 to 1964. 61 to 64, and from what I hear from a lot of people, I barely remember then because I was busy having little babies then, uh, there was a tremendous struggle in those years on, called the Book War, right? <laughs> yes, sir. Called the Book War. We had our problems, that's Why true. don't you tell us the story of that? Well, I'll, I'll do my best. Okay. Back in 1961, the residents of Rossmore found themselves in a relatively new area. They came from relatively different backgrounds, social, economic, geographic. And there was a, quite a professional group. They were upwardly mobile, mobile, independent people. They had firm ideas on how they thought things should be done. Rossmore, as you know, it was unincorporated and still is. And it was run by county government way far away in Santa Ana. So the local Los Alamitos Elementary School District Board was a place where the residents could come and express their opinions. Mm -hmm. And in those days, uh, various diverse groups arose. And they would come to the school board and want motions made and passed, official motions, either for or against something, whatever was uh, the subject on their mind. And in, in those days, at the school board meeting, anybody could come, bring their tape recorder, and, re and record whatever they like. It's a little intimidating. <laughs> so if you had something to say be on one of the matters before the board, for example, uh -huh. and started to speak, somebody would thrust a microphone in front of you and say, speak clearly, please, you're, on, you're being taped. And some people would, of course, object to that. They felt intimidated. Yeah. And they were told, no, no, we're, we're not trying to intimidate you. This is for the sake of accuracy when we quote you later on. <laughs> Anyhow, it was bound to happen a group arose, and they wanted the local school board to condemn the state-selected elementary textbooks that were meant to be used in all the elementary districts throughout the state of California. All of them, Henry? All of them. These textbooks are mandated by state law and they're supposed to be used throughout the state of California. And this group wanted most of those textbooks taken out of the classroom and put on the back shelf never to be used again. And they said, you can get alternate textbooks, and we'll help you select them, actually. We just want to help you. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, they also had a list. They had a list of about six authors. And they wanted any work that contained in part or a full book by these authors not to be purchased by the district and publishers of textbooks to be so informed. Heading, it was really a blacklist of authors. Sure. The name of Carl Sandburg headed that list. Carl Sandburg? Carl Sandburg, the historian, poet, Lincoln biographer. He was a recipient of a congressional award honoring his services to America. Any work or any poem by Carl Sandburg could no longer be used in the Los Alamitos Elementary School District because this group said it would subvert the minds of the young children. Not the actual physical words as they appeared on the written page, mm -hmm. but something would come through between those lines and would be undetected by an adult mind, but would be able to strike a fertile, imaginative young mind and somehow subvert that person. What this group really was doing was questioning the patriotism of those authors without actually saying it, uh -huh. because they would be involved, obviously, in lawsuits for slander, and this was their method of getting around that. Uh, what have we got against the elementary textbooks, we asked them. And the spokesman for the group said, well, take a look at that geography book, you know, the one where the author uses the format of having a family get into an airplane and fly to London. Let's say it was the Jones family who did that. They would fly to London, and then the author would describe the English people and talk about England. Then the Jones family would get on the airplane, and they would fly to Paris. And the author would describe France and the French people and they would go on to Rome and they would talk about the Italian people in Italy and so forth around the world, flying from country to country and the Jones family would be doing this and the author would describe each country and the people mm -hmm. of that country. The spokesman for the group said, 
They call that a geography book, but that's only to fool you. That's really a book that teaches one worldism, and that's un American, and we want that to stop. Mm -hmm. Now, all this went on at a school board meeting that was attended by well over 200 people. 200 people? Yeah, and the reporter from well, that the doesn't happen often. No, the reporter from the News Enterprise was there, the reporter from the surrounding areas, the reporter from Long Beach. The uh, newspapers across the country in various cities picked up the censorship, censorship story. And uh, Los Alamitos had made the big time. Book Magazine had expressed an interest Is in doing right? a display of that. Anyhow, this uh, meeting went on well into the wee hours. Speaker after speaker spoke on all phases of the subject. And finally, you know, the school board had to do something if they agreed and wanted to do something different and have those books in the classroom, they had to make a positive motion uh -huh. to that thing. If they took no action at all, and because it was mandated by state law, the books automatically would go into the classrooms. For those auxiliary uh, additional textbooks, which were meant for the classroom and paid for with local district funds, or perhaps would go to stock the school libraries, the school board, again, they would need a positive motion if they in, in order to clarify mm -hmm. their particular position. Well, this went on until it was past one in the morning, and finally the school board came to a decision. And a, uh, a motion was made, seconded, and passed that no action would be taken in regard to the state-selected textbooks. In regard to those books purchased with local district funds, then local district policy, would con normal policy had been used for years, would continue to be used. How close had Los Elementary, Elementary School District come to becoming the, a book censor? The vote not to be a censor was three to two. That's how close we came to being but notoriously known Henry, across the country. But, aren't there channels that you can go through to uh, ask that a book be removed from... Yes, now let, let me just briefly touch on the uh, state selection process, for example. Before the state actually approves books for use in elementary schools, they have a panel of experts that go through and select them tentatively. And then they put them on, the tentative selections are put on display in 30 locations up and down the state. And anybody can go to those locations, look at the books, physically examine uh -huh. them, and they have written forms there, and they actually ply you with a pen even. And if you have an objection, you, you write down what it is that you object to, and those go back to the committee, and they're reviewed. And if they think they require a reply or a revision, then mm -hmm. they do that. This is all done before that's they ever all, get... That's all done before they are finally selected for the... For uh -huh. permanently. In spite of all that, the, uh, this particular group said, no, they didn't like those books for the, some of the reasons I've mentioned, and they just didn't want us to use them. Yeah. And it caused, uh, as you can imagine, quite a commotion. And, and it went on for quite a while, a lot of yes, heartache. Well, you know, in a way, sometimes uh, as a member of a school board or any other board, you go to these meetings and for weeks on end you see nobody. And you conduct your business. It's supposed to be a public right. meeting. <laughs> you, you wish somebody would come in. <laughs> that's right. know, talk to us, please. We're doing the community's business. And here we would have meetings that would go on well past midnight. This was only one topic that I covered. And we would have uh, hundreds of people, literally hundreds of people out there, tape recorders. I had my own tape recorder. And on battery power, I point out the school board, I'm not even using the district's electricity, <laughs> uh, to defend myself, really, so that I would have a record of what I said, so that later on, when the newspaper said that they said that Zach said this, or that, I would have my own tape and say, this is what, <laughs> this is what we said. Oh, that was a scary time, wasn't it? Yes, it was. But it, it, it was a time when the community was new and young, and I hope and I believe that we've come through that, and that we're pulling together a lot mm -hmm. better now. Mm -hmm. yeah. You remember that time? Oh, sure, yeah. Everybody remembers. Right. Right. Yes. That's old time. Photographers were out there snapping <laughs> pictures of people coming to meetings, <laughs> yeah. taking down license plates. Taking down license plates? Oh, yes. Well, they're trying yeah. to you don't mean newspaper photographers. You no, mean no. Private, private, private people. Private yes, people. private people. Well, that was happening in a lot of places in the yeah. United States. That, wasn't that about ways. the McCarthy era, though, too? Yeah. 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 yeah, there was yeah that, that's right. In that time, yeah. the time frame, yes. We're you know, another question I have of you. Um, I'd like you to explain this because I just found this out a little while ago from you. The situation of why there's no schools in the Rossmore Highland or in College Park and all the children go to the Rossmore schools. Explain the reasoning behind that. 
Well, federal law requires that schools be located at some minimum distance away from airports and airfields. And in those days, it was a Los, called the Los Alamitos Naval Air Station. Uh -huh. And the highlands are on one, one boundary, one the north-south periphery of that. And College Park East is on the southern periphery. And they're within the distance that's proscribed. And federal law will not allow school districts to place schools that close to an airport for obvious safety reasons. That caused quite a, a problem to the district at the time. Rossmore had just been built. And there were all those new children coming in that had to go to school. The highlands were being built. And they're not, all the homes are uh, tracked as going up in, in a time frame. And uh, schools go up following the children. What happens is that the staff of the school district uh, go around and, and every time a, a track map is filed, they see how many homes are going to be built here. And they would take 1.3 children per, uh, per home as a say mm -hmm. as an average figure, and they would calculate how many kids this tract is going to generate, how many classrooms we need, how many schools we need, and then you apply for funds. But you don't get the funds until the foundations are poured. Then you go out and you count the foundations. That is proof that those homes are going to be built and will generate the children oh. you say are going to be generated. Uh -huh. So generally what happens is the kids come, the homes are then with foundations, and it's not that long from then that the house is built and the children are there. But the school is just starting to get going. So invariably, the children come before the mm -hmm. school is built. And what would then happen would be that as the track would go up, people would move in. They want the kids to go to school. Well, we had a policy that if the school year had started to cause as little disruption and commotion as possible, the new children coming in during the school year, we would pick a, a school, generally it was Laurel School. Mm -hmm. And they would go there. And the following year, the the board would, with the advice of superintendent and staff, would decide the local attendance areas for the local school, and then those children would join their, their compatriots from their own area and be reassigned and go into to a, a, Rossmore, a school. Rossmore school. And every year there was a commotion. The people who, who had the, uh, children in the school already obviously wanted them there. The new people would want to go into the Rossmore school. Yeah. So that's why they all came over to the Rossmore School? Yeah, and, they would and didn't you say the realtors would say to the Highland people, well, there's a school just a few blocks away? Well, they, they, they were mentioning that it was Los Alamitos Boulevard. Well, they, they, had to go they were supposed to tell you what the situation was, but uh, being human and wanting to make a sale, they would say, it, as you suggest, in such a way, they wouldn't really lie about it, but they uh -huh. wouldn't really quite tell you how it's going to be. Uh, the problems <laughs> of getting there. Well, we're half point in the program again. You know what that means? Oh. <laughs> then and now. So we're going to break away, but when we come back, Paul, I'd like to hear about the roads and the, the big freeway problem when oh, the freeway yes. went in behind Rossmar. All right? You going to be ready? Sounds great. Okay, <laughs> take her away.
Welcome back. Let's go right to Paul. Paul, tell us the freeway story. Well, the freeway story, of course, starts back before there were no freeways. Uh, uh, the San Diego freeway wasn't there. The 605 freeway wasn't there. And uh, you, as I mentioned in one of the earlier shows, uh, you got to Rossmore down a two-lane road That's from right. from Seventh Street, or you came down Catella, which was just a, a narrow road at the time, and you couldn't cross in over into uh, uh, Long Beach unless you went over the Seventh Street to Bridge or mm -hmm. uh, north further north. Uh, uh, as I recall, there was no Catella Bridge or Spring Street Spring Street Bridge at the time. Uh, the freeway was sort of a, a a known and an unknown factor uh, when the uh, state highway, uh, what I understand, when the state highway uh, uh, people first planned the, free, the 605 freeway, it was designed to come down through the center of Rossmore proper, uh, wow. which would be very disastrous for the community of Rossmore. Wow. say the least. <laughs> so Ross, Ross Cortesi, who was uh, uh, very, uh, on good, very, very good terms with state officials, was able to get the root of the freeway moved to the western uh, uh, perimeter of Rossmore, uh, but everything got sort of uh, uh, diaphanous out, out beyond uh, that perimeter of Rossmore, and people that bought weren't sure whether the freeway was going to be on the other side of right. what eventually became mm -hmm. the Los Angeles uh, Flood Control Channel River, uh, or on this side. And uh, the salesmen were very careful not to give you any more information than you asked for. Uh, they didn't have the disclosure laws. Well, you told they told me it was going to be a golf course. In there. <laughs> <laughs> but in any event, uh, uh, people were uh, rather uh, amazed when uh, the freeway started to come in and these huge mounds of dirt appeared behind Martha Ann Boulevard over there. Uh, and then uh, an additional surprise was the fact that uh, a cloverleaf was scheduled uh, uh, right at the corner of uh, yes, the 605 right. freeway and uh, Spring Street, mm -hmm. and or is that Willow? Willow. Willow. Mm -hmm. Willow. And it turned out that about five Rossmore homes that had been built right on the corner of, uh, well, I don't remember the streets, but right uh -huh. there at the Cloverleaf were going to have to uh, come, out. come out. And uh, some people were putting in their pools and wow. uh, uh, they had additions to their homes. And so there was quite a battle in the Rossmore Homeowners Association. Uh, uh, was successful in getting uh, uh, getting the attention of then Governor Pat Brown, the senior mm -hmm. Brown, uh, to uh, write a letter uh, and use his influence with Caltrans. And I'm sure there was some behind the scenes political move maneuvering that went mm -hmm. on, but uh, the cloverleaf was eventually uh, shifted. Uh, but the freeway did go in and much closer than anybody suspected. Wasn't there talk right once there. of a four level or five level interchange also going on in there? There was. Well, 55 there was, to 60 really? feet yeah. high? Yeah. But the, uh, yeah. the Rossmore Homeowners Association also led a battle to, uh, uh, to uh, put the uh, shrubberies and the landscaping mm -hmm. in uh, before uh, the freeway was actually oh, built. Oh, good. They've really done a lot, led a lot of they battles, really did, They really did, yes, yes. And uh, as a consequence, by the time the freeway was actually in there, uh, the uh, shrubs and trees were high enough to baffle a good deal of the noise. Mm -hmm. Of, of course, we're going through the sound wall battle now, so yeah. it that, almost that's seems been like going on and back and forth. That's an for ongoing years. story. After all, well, yeah. I think it looks close now, yeah. doesn't it? Yes, it, it's a, a strong possibility, but it, it, it may require some self-funding that uh -huh. we would possibly get back in the future. But uh, a little story on the freeway. That freeway opened one week before I delivered my youngest child, and I had to go out and practice that week how to get to the hospital on that freeway because we had done all the runs on the side road. On the side road. <laughs> <laughs> we had to go make a run that last week on the freeway. So uh, it opened for me just in time. <laughs> well, speaking of one other interesting battle that the Rossmore Homeowners Association was successful in, uh, the, the uh, people in Long Beach uh, wanted to uh, uh, cross the, the flood control channel with Atherton and extend it on to Bostonian. Uh, which would have had a, dr a, a direct route into yeah, the was wall the community. Street. <laughs> into the wall community. Mm -hmm. uh, with north and south. Yeah, and that uh, that big furor was created. And uh, that's one of the nice things about Rossmore. There are no through streets. If you're in here, you should have a purpose. That's correct. You're not traveling through. That's very true. And it's it is a good. We've been point. able to keep it that way. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, I uh, also would like to know a little bit. How has Rossmore 
How have they governed themselves from the very beginning? Can you give us sort of a run through from the beginning up well, until now? Everybody, we've talked earlier in shows about the incorporation and annexation uh -huh. attempts that failed, which would have put us in a city. So we've always been governed by the, uh, the County Board of Supervisors, uh, uh, in, and particularly the second district. The way the County Board of Supervisors uh, uh, works is that uh, uh, it's divided into a number of districts throughout the county, and uh, the district that we're in happens to be the second, second supervisorial yeah, right. district. Uh -huh. At present, yeah, it's yeah. Harriet Weeder, and before that, it was Dave Baker, and it went back to Willis Warm Warner, who was alluded to in some of the mm -hmm. earlier shows, and Larry Schmidt uh, was our supervisor for a while. But that person, that one person, working through their county staff, actually governs Rossmore, and for a long time, Rossmore had almost no input as a, a community at all. We we originally were what was called a community maintenance district. All right. And the county would t tell us what how they were going to sweep our streets uh -huh. or anything like. In '74, uh, the county uh, allowed us to become what was called a community, uh, a county service area, and it's, we're called County Service Area Number 21. And uh, the Rossmore Homeowners Association was given quasi-governmental jurisdiction mm -hmm. to advise the county about the workings of this uh, county service area. Because there are 11,000 people. There are 11,000 people. Rossmore alone. But, and the reason that, that the county service area was chiefly formed was they wanted to, uh, to make a park out of, uh, out of what was the old Wilson School site. Mm -hmm. uh, That's right. And uh, in order for the, the mechanism of government to be able mm -hmm. to acquire that park, they had to set up the uh, a community service area. Oh, I see. And it is our one and only park. That's correct at the present time. We have a facility down on uh, uh, Montecito called the Montecito facility mm -hmm. uh, that the community is hoping to establish as a southern uh, a recreational area uh -huh. in it has the near future. On it. Yeah, that, that, Very small area. Yeah. Yeah, that park site was at one time a school site. And at the time I was on the board, we declared that a surplus site. And so that the community could then. Uh, raise funds to in order to landscape it and having done that the school district then maintained it and then sometime after I got off the board it, it actually uh, was sold in order to be a park in the federal funds state funds uh, uh -huh. local funds a park. And with a, well a one-time assessment park. yes it turned out to be really a real, real beautiful mm -hmm. plan as, as, as I recall Henry that Cortesi paid about twenty four hundred dollars an acre for all the land that he bought in uh, from Bixby's and uh, the school site, uh, as I recall, was uh, sold to the community for around $13,000 an acre, uh, just my recollection. Still a bargain. <laughs> Still a bargain. But again, it was uh, when it was declared surplus, or when we landscaped it, yeah. uh, the school board uh, required this landscaping. Again, the Rossmore Homeowners Association held fund drives. And, uh -huh. and, and, and uh, to gather the money to do that. Some of us back in 1961, 62, remember serving on the Save Our Parks yeah, Committee. I remember going to a pancake breakfast. Yeah, and we had dances, uh, that, yeah. and <laughs> we went over and planted the trees yeah. physically. Uh -huh. and. Uh, I lived right across the street from the park, so well, I was quite very far. <laughs> anxious <laughs> to have that park go in. Well, a lot of people donate <laughs> trees, uh, like the uh, uh, Rossmore Women's Club. They, they did. Uh, they the did. Pres the outgoing president always has a choice of where she wants her tree planted. There you that give them started all the way back in, uh -huh. in the early 60s. And PTA presidents and so on usually get a tree planted in their name, and they can pick a spot. And a lot of them are going into that park and have gone in. Well, I can remember. I'll dig the holes. Uh, yeah, yeah. I can remember some of the backstops were donated by uh, uh, the, the Lobberdettes, uh, the mm -hmm. AJ Supply uh, Company over there. Yeah. That was a community project yeah. where everybody pulled together. That was well, a, very gratifying. Let's <laughs> go on on how we've been governing ourselves. Okay. Let's bring it up to date. Up to date, uh, we've been a, a county service area uh, up until, well, we still are our county service area, uh, but starting in the uh, 85, 86 year, uh, the county has taken away about uh, oh, 40 percent of our funds that we were getting in the past as a county, a county service area. So we're showing a shortfall mm -hmm. uh, every year uh, from what our operating expenses are to take care of the, the park and sweep our streets and, and trim our trees. Uh, so right now there is an effort being made to form a community service district. Mm -hmm which is uh, still under the county uh, jurisdiction, 
but it elects a five-person board of directors. Five persons. Yeah, and if we form that five-person board of directors, we will get what, what the county says are special district augmentation funds back from the, the county. They're taking them away from us now. And that'll be about $135,000 a year we'll get back that they've, they've taken okay. since uh -huh. uh, they've changed the law. So our, our operating budget for the, community, uh, the county service area is about $222,000 at the present time. And we're spending more than that, but we're using our reserves. So by forming the com community service district, we hope to get back enough so that we will not have to bite into the reserves and we'll be able to maintain our parks and streets the way they are now. Now that five-member board has to be elected by the people yeah. in Rossmore, right? They do, yeah. And there's an election the, coming the, up, I understand. That's that in November. In November. And how many people have applied for that to run? Uh, eight. So far. Oh, well, no, it, well, it, it closed it, today. It closed today, so that's today. This, is, yeah. this is the 28th so of August. So eight people have filed and five of, of will people be will, be, will be elected. Yeah. I hope history doesn't repeat itself. Paul is running again. Paul's re oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> He'll make it. He'll make it. I thought He'll yeah, make but, it. Yes. but then they'll vote down the CSD <laughs> yeah, like not. they did cities years ago. That's what I like about this town. It's small enough that everyone knows everyone's politics, and I think it's great. Yeah. We are surrounded, for Dawson Creek's sake, we are surrounded right up to our, bo our borders with other towns. There's no break. There's no That's country true. out there. Well, we do have the strawberry fields, but we are enclosed by other towns, but there's still a real hometown feeling about Los Alamitos. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's because so many families have stayed here for so many generations, but even though I live in Rossmore, I feel like I'm a real part of, of Los Alamitos. I'm sure you do too. Oh yeah, absolutely. Right, even though we're not part of the city, it's my city to me. Yes. Everything they do, I get involved in and love it. So that's why we're doing this series. That's why we're doing this. Well, I really appreciate you two with all your knowledge coming on, taking your time. It's been a lot of time getting ready for this and shooting, and really appreciate you coming on. It's been fun. Good. Nice Has it been fun? Been nice Good. to work with you, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Paul. And we have another show for you next week, so please tune in, and we'll be there to tell you everything you ever wanted to know about Los Alamitos. <laughs>